Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Bonsoir, mesdames et messieurs. Thank you very much for coming in such a great number and from faraway locations. Today's Dharma talk bears a very challenging title, it's Living Dangerously in the 21st Century. Is it just the 21st century when we live dangerously? When does life and death become a challenge? When does it pose any danger? If you remember your own upbringing, your own childhood, when did the first real conflict appear? When did you ask your first deep question? When was it that you determined that you would find the answer? The moment uh, you set out on your own path to find some truth, something deeper, that's when you start living dangerously. Because you want your own way. It is intricately and inevitably connected by developing your own I as a growing person. And the ego as a product of your endeavors is inevitable but not indispensable, as you can see. The real question is, what kind of challenge do we undertake? Life is a huge undertaking by itself. If you look at the mind and if you look at the body, if you look at various functions of the mind related to various centers, we can find lots of incompatibilities, inconsistencies, paradoxes, so we find a lot of challenge in our lives. Where is the danger? For one, we have this body which is truly impermanent, dependent and imperfect. Impermanent because we don't live that long. The trees, the mountains, the rivers, the sea, they last way longer than we do. We are dependent, no matter what kind of idea we have about liberté or freedom. For five minutes we shut down oxygen in this room, everybody's dead. And we are imperfect because you look at your own face ten years ago, five years ago and now, and you project what happens in ten years, twenty or thirty, that's a projection you can afford. <laughs> Then you see the imperfection looking back at you from the mirror. And it's not the mirror's problem, it's your expectation's problem. So you have this body and you have a mind which yearns for permanence, perfection and complete independence. That's the major built-in danger of being born with this kind of mind and this kind of body. How do we manage that? How do we resolve that? And that was the Buddha's question when he didn't just follow his karma, but he actually set out on his journey and turned over his social conventions and went into the forest to practice. Now we have less and less forests to practice in, but we have wonderful apartments and zendos and uh, ashrams and temples where we can do that. And asking a question, what am I really? Where do I come from? Why was I born? That is a question that we either ask or it haunts us for the rest of our lives. Human beings are not just curious. We are deeply intertwined with our lives and deaths on this planet. So we cannot not ask questions. We are always curious why we are in the way we are. Why we have this karma that we have how much we have brought, how much we have acquired, to what extent can we be responsible for our own destiny if there is something like that. And these questions lead us to other questions. And in Zen we say that 10,000 questions are one question. That is, what am I or what is this? What is this that sees with my eyes, hears with my ears, feels with my heart, speaks with my voice? So what is that? And as long as we think and have this dualistic idea, starting with I and the world, as long as we have conceptual thinking, we cannot find the answer. Now, that's the first real danger. When you start to look outside of your comfort zone of established thinking, established norms, established knowledge, you start to go beyond those borders because you don't know what you find. 
In fact, this don't know is what you find. And that is uncertain. And that's why people many times are way more attached to their suffering rather than seek for a solution. Why is that? Suffering is certain. Suffering is something we know. Suffering is something that is comprised out of our own habits. We can even blame people for it. It's very kind of sweet when we can blame people. Because you project your own responsibility to someone else. But suddenly finding the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, or the end of suffering, or the, or the way to end suffering, that's very challenging. Because finally we have to grow up mentally. We have to grow up spiritual and become responsible persons. And there's no other path to that than awakening. There are many religions and many schools that teach some kind of salvation, awakening, enlightenment, you name it. There's tons of it. But what is the common denominator of all this? What happens ge generically and genuinely to people who set out on this path and they walk on it? Uh, first of all, they have to face the truth. They have to face the truth of what we think we are and what we truly are that's different. <coughs> and we face the facts first inside that our ideas, our concepts, our imagination is not up to the truth to the extent that we attach to our ignorance, anger, and desire. That's the gap. That's the gap between truth and illusion. So the moment we realize that, we see how we reproduce these dualistic ideas. We reproduce this anger, desire, and ignorance moment to moment. That's what makes us sick. That's what makes us totally depressed. That's what drains you from energy. But on the other hand, the correct cultivation of dualistic emotions and thoughts, they can also give you great insights and happiness and joy, except that we not always have the handle on it. We can't handle these things, our karma, many times to a sufficient and necessary extent. What's the difference? The difference is insight. The difference is clarity. The difference is a certain level of awakening or letting go of your idea of yourself. And when that happens, then you face the truth. You face the truth of your karma, the world's karma, your interdependence, and what it means to be born into this human body. What the potentials are that you have, what the limitations are that you have. You face all that. And by then you have left your comfort zone long time ago. Your self-image vanished somewhere in the past, you know. Just like a city which you visit back after 15, 20 years and you say, wow, I used to eat there. But you have no more relationship to that at all. You just see it. That's how ideas of self, that's how self-image, that's how ego prints, they can just be gone. When the Buddha teaches about emptiness, most of you already understand that it has nothing to do with the Western concept of nihilism, nothing like that. Rather than that, it talks about, in graphic and clear terms, of the non-existence of karma, essentially. So when the sixth patriarch, Queen Eng, says originally nothing, he wasn't an existentialist or a nihilistic person. He said, what you have is something you made. We made all this. What you experience inside your heart, your mind, in the world, we made all this. Originally, it didn't exist. So how did we come to this? How did we come to 7 billion people living on this planet with this state of affairs? How did we come to us going back at home, back home, and in the evening we wonder what we've done on that day and why? So that's the inertia of our karma. That's our unperceived karma. That's our ignorance we carry forth over and over again, and most of that ignorance is willful because we don't want to see. We have our self-defense mechanisms. We want our personality to remain intact. Like the Greeks believe, the atom is indivisible and you can't go any deeper. So I really hope in the West, you know, in fact, I don't have to hope. We no longer have to wait hundreds of years to crack the surface of the seemingly indivisible self. You can see deep inside how fluxes of thoughts and emotions 
and notions of past, present, and future create your image of personality. It's not more or less true than the clouds in the sky. But if we don't understand the nature of the clouds, we can get suddenly very rainy and wet because we didn't bring our umbrellas. So if we don't understand the way our personality is built up, we can be surprised by our own karma. Very unexpected hits of your own dualistic outbursts. So living dangerously actually means you turn your energy inside and you are prepared to see whatever you see by questioning who you are. And it's an inquiry, not a doubt. In fact, there are many translations that translate the great question, what is this, into a doubt. That's not a doubt, it's an inquiry. And that deep inquiry goes layer by layer, perception by perception, and if you let go what you actually saw, then you can go deeper. If you get stuck with any other identity, then you are stuck with that new imposed self-image. And then you're stuck on the way. Your new I, my, me doesn't let you go. But in meditation, there are many golden rules, but one is, whatever appears, let it disappear. Because if it appears and disappears, then that's not what we are looking for. But there's something which perceives all this. There's something which perceives appearance and disappearance. What is that? When you find that, when you have a glimpse, some kind of attainment to that, then it, things begin to change. If you can keep this clarity moment to moment, your recognition of a situation, the establishment of a relationship, the way you sustain or end those relationships, the way you perform in life, they all come to place because you and this world become one. The wall of yourself disappeared because you had the courage to bring it down, to let it disintegrate. And it's not falling apart. Okay? It's not being dysfunctional. It's not losing something you essentially need. When you walk on the path, you can only use, lose your illusions, nothing else. Your true self is something you already have. Your true nature is something no one can give you. You can only lose your own ideas. So the common denominator between all the paths and religion, if I may say as a suggested conclusion, that you lose your ego. That's the only thing you can do. Everything else is impermanent, conditioned, and imperfect. So the only thing you can do in this incarnation is lose your illusions. And that can be translated in positive terms as salvation, enlightenment, emancipation, oneness, nowness, whatever. But as long as your I, my, me is there, you can't. The moment your I is gone, you can. It's that simple. So. Many of us, we can see that the sky is blue and the trees are green. For how long? How long does it take before your projections set in? How long can you keep the image of another person clear in your mind, in your heart? How long can you sustain a desired relationship? How long can you stay loyal to a group of people where you do your job or do your proper function? This is a marathon, not a sprint. So when you do your committed practice with your mind and you live a committed life on the outside, then this is sustained practice. You don't have to cut your hair for that. You only have to cut your illusions for that. So I think this is plenty for introductory. And now I would really like to welcome your questions as they come. Okay. You use the word your true nature. Yes. Could you go a bit deeper into that? I just did. You can't put that into name and form originally. We tag it with various definitions, but there originally there's no name, no form. So the next depth is this. But 
not to be stuck at the substance level. Next is really the sky is blue, trees are green, we have wonderful faces sitting, you know, 25, 30 of us. That's truth. The first was substance, that's the hardest to express. But this thing which we cannot express is clear like space, clear like a mirror. So it reflects everything as it is, moment to moment. <coughs> You're looking at me, I'm looking at you. So that's our truth as it is reflected. And next is correct function. So that's all our true nature from three <coughs> views, substance, truth, and function. All the three views are valid. All strike a different angle, and all are necessary. If we don't attain substance, then truth doesn't become clear. If we don't perceive truth, we are attached to emptiness. And if we don't perform correct function, then we remain still and passive, just immersed in the truth. But then comes function. It's really, it's really, I would say, complete in this way. Like light, still images, and motion picture. Interesting. Thank you. More questions? <coughs> yeah. Can I ask how, how important has prayer been in your um, in the in the Zen practice that define you know, prayer for me? I guess um, by prayer I mean um, going outside of yourself to some some inspirational vocational um, poetic lines perhaps or um, something linked to the Buddha um, but something that you might actually say and enunciate on a day-to-day -day basis or as you may perhaps begin your meditation or finish the day um, but I guess yeah, by prayer I mean something that you might actually say say yeah. to the Buddha or Bodhisattvas uh, or just as you begin the practice, uh, perhaps to the Bodhisattva, perhaps to the Buddha. I guess I'm thinking in terms of, for me, I, um, I wonder, once upon a time I might have prayed in, in, a different, in, in a very different way. And it's been a long, long time. Um, but as I'm um, very interested in pursuing no self and awakening, oneness, etc. I um, I wonder about a bit of um, help. Just a little help? Yeah. <laughs> From my friend? Yeah. yeah. Okay. In the sense you say, I never prayed. Um, if you believe that the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are separate from you, <coughs> you pray. If you believe that you and them share the same substance, that moment you transform your consciousness. And for that you may even chant. You, do, uh, you kind of do an active and clear act of transformation of your consciousness using projected or externalized principles. Those principles are embodied in the Bodhisattvas. So the Bodhisattva is a projection of your compassion, wisdom, healing power, whatever, and that's why when you say you go outside of yourself, let me rephrase that, when you forget yourself, you don't go outside, you forget yourself, then inside and outside become one, and then you only chant Kwan San Bosa, or you recite the Great Rani of Compassion. That transforms your consciousness exactly by leaving those boundaries behind that you call the self. And you may reestablish that after the retreat or when your mantra practice is over, but it will never be the same, because they were removed. And once they are removed, you don't believe that they are absolute or permanent, or they are kind of imposed upon you as a person. So I never prayed, but I did a lot of mantra practice. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Can you explain more about this function? Isn't the function something that we have in our minds and therefore is part of our eyes and knees and stuff. When I arrived at Garda Lest, what did you do? Pick you up. Yeah, that's function. Somebody's hungry, give them food. Somebody arrives, pick them up. Somebody is thirsty, give that person drink. Extremely clear and simple. 
but our own ideas, what is right and wrong, what is good and bad, prevent us from performing these functions correctly. And it's not a simplistic answer. It's a simple answer. This kind of simplicity does not take away any of your qualities, but it gives you control over your qualities. And that is very important. So basically, correct function means you connect to that person or situation 100%. And once you have done that, you follow your own vows, whatever vows you have. And I don't mean just bodhisattva vows. Everybody has principles and purposes based on those principles. And that gives you a sense of direction in life. That also defines how you function in a given situation, whether you are the culprit or the victim or the police. So function is extremely simple, and when you and this world become one, then you can actually help other beings. In our tradition, we actually distinguish between two kinds of function. One is the subject just like this. I'll explain that later. The other is the object just like this. Let me give you an example. Uh, when somebody is happy and you are happy, you share that emotion and you join with that emotion, that's a subject just like this because you took that situation and just merged with it. You took that upon yourself as a subject. Okay? But when somebody is hungry, you give that person food. When somebody is sad, you try to improve them or make them a little happier. When somebody is deep down in a pit, you don't jump down, you actually help them up and out. That's object just like this. So you approach the situation as something that you have to change or complement or something that, it, that seemingly is external to you. Okay? So these two functions are really, really important to distinguish because many times somebody is depressed and you go straight into the depression yourself believing that you help. No, you don't. You may temporarily showing some compassion, but then you have to kind of loop out of it and take your own initiative to bring the person out. Okay? Joy is the same. Before joy goes into an overdrive, you establish the direction of staying in the middle way, and you can actually cool that joy down to stay centered, not to get carried away by any sensation. And you can do that to your family, to friends, to anybody, and, uh, oh, you just sobered me up. But you didn't oppose, you didn't judge, you didn't develop anything dualistic. So just like this is, in other terms, suchness or thusness, or in Sanskrit, tathata. That means that you do not use your dualistic concepts that would lead to judgments when you describe something or someone. It's so easy to fall into that. So you can describe various emotional and intellectual properties without labeling the person good or bad. Right or wrong. And that is the key to correct function. If your judgments block the way, you cannot relate correctly. You are narrowed down by your own conceptual uh, judgmental mind. Seventh consciousness, we talked about it. So, when you have no dualistic blocks, then the attainment of substance, the perception of truth, and the performance of function are all clear. But isn't fun function always aimed at something? Getting someone out of the hole or whatever? Something or someone. Or someone? I think that's plenty wide. This is wide enough. Of course function is directed, but not only to something, also to someone. Look at relationship, you know, training, or just maintaining correct relationship. You know, what is the function of getting a bouquet of flowers to your wife? It's rather someone and not something in that function. But it, I only do it because everyone does it, and they say it's what the husband does. Ah, oh, Judith, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the good thing. See? Who doesn't do it everyone does. I have a, a couple of good family therapists in my position. Anyway, uh, 
you so you see something or someone that is direct of course it's directed it's important it is directed it lines up with your own internal direction in your mind internal means you actually define a kind of ethos a raison d'être or something like a morality that you adhere to ethic principles that you follow it all clicks every single second when you make decisions More questions? Anything? I just said, yes, said like joking, speaking. jokingly about family therapy. But, but while you were speaking earlier, I was thinking of psychoanalysis and the inner quest and also the disillusionment at the end of analysis. And I was wondering whether you could make some ties with what you're talking about and uh, analysis. Analysis? Well, first I would have to make some ties with an analyst because I'm not one. Actually, uh, I, I ventured into various, mm, I would say, layers of applied psychology, not as a therapist, not even as a trainee, but somebody who helped certain psychological groups to develop meditation completely compatible with the practice, the psychological practice that they have been doing. In that sense, I have some experience. And what, I mean, the largest, I would say, the broadband connection between Buddhism and psychology is that the notion of self is so clearly different in the West and in the East and we can learn from each other. So when the Buddha says anatta or anatman in Sanskrit and the sixth patriarch says originally nothing, they both, along with others that I don't quote now, strike upon the same point that your ego, your I, my, me originally does not exist. It's made. It's made of our karma. It's our most important and most familiar illusions as, illusion as we know it. And I look at Western psychology and starting from Freud and Jung and others, everybody, they never question that the ego is something solid. Lately in America, last 10, 15 years, but based on the influence of Buddhism, they developed something different. Something in between the notion of a solid ego or the non-existence of self or personality. And that is one of the most paradigmatic, in other words, important changes in the last 60 years in Western thought and our approach to ourselves. And ourselves not just as an individual, but also as a family, as a society, as a civilization, also as species. What is Homo sapiens sapiens on the power of two? Well, someone or a, a species that can perceive itself better than before. That's how wisdom can be defined. So if you say the ego exists, it's a mistake. If you say it doesn't exist, it's also a mistake. So we could learn from one another based on the Apidhamma, which is the accumulation of Buddhist psychology and meditation experience, and it's a fantastic treasure trove. And there is, you know, the Western psychology and psychoanalysis when Suddenly, scientific principles that had been directed to material inquiries suddenly turn towards man as a species, as an, as an object of science. And we started to study inside, not just the outside. What happens in our psyche, in our ego, in our whatever we think of ourselves, because we were carrying huge problems, we still do. As a group, we definitely do, because the kind of human average of suffering never really changed. The environment changed, the te technology changed, the, you know, co communication infrastructure, whatever, they, they changed. Human consciousness essentially did not. But what your place is among the seven billion, that's what matters. And uh, the Western approach with psychoanalysis and the oriental approach with, with meditation practice is one of those rare complementary practices that can actually form something truly deep and powerful. And once you get to know both to some extent, you see the potential in it. You see the potential in engaged Buddhism because you can go to different places where karma is really tough. And uh, rehabs and detox stations and jails and uh, pe where people are in tensely suffering, that is 
the place where you can really show forth the power of the Dharma because you can bring those people closer to enlightenment. Especially because they suffer so much. They have to reflect. I mean, some refuse. There was a guy in, in prison about 10 years ago. I give a talk, and I talk about suffering and the cause of suffering, and he says, your fundamental principle is wrong. And I said, why? You are in here. You will be in here for three more years. You've been here for four. What are you talking about? He says, I made the decision. That's why I talked about direction in, in terms of idea. I made a decision to support my family uh, from theft. My time in prison is calculated into that. I don't consider this suffering as part of my investment. Now, these guys will never listen before they get actually emotionally, intellectually, existentially hammered to the extent that they lose this very thick crust of themselves. I mean, the guy was two meters tall and 120 kilograms of pure muscle and aggression. What do you expect? So, you can't talk sense into people before they open up. And what is it that opens them up? It's their own questions or their own suffering combined. So I think if we very carefully and humbly and truthfully combine East and West, we can get something truly potentially healing and powerful for us, humanity as a whole. Well, because the, the question now is about psychoanalysis, just I wanted to say before my other question that listening to you it really spoke to me. I mean, this is, I am psychoanalyst and it, you know, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I don't know, I don't know whether I'm on that level, which level it is, you know, I mean, how, but it's so, it so made sense with what I do in my practice. But the question I wanted to ask you was, what place do you give to ritual? Huge. First and Why? foremost, we, we, we should have rituals that we actually believe in. Without rituals, we cannot uh, purify our karma. We cannot actually connect to anything outside of ourselves. I mean, even the evening meal in a family where everybody's there and they talk, that's a ritual. We eat together, we share our thoughts and our emotions, that's a ritual. We, I mean, at least in Europe, we begin together with a bon appetit and we say thank you at the end. But some people say grace, some people have some kind of ritual, like we had our mini silence at the beginning of our Dharma talk. So rituals are hugely important, which is, uh, I don't want to sound materialistic, but it's an agreed procedure to a definite end or purpose. And there is trust in it because you cannot define each and every step scientifically. I've been part of hundreds of rituals as a Buddhist monk. And honestly, in the first couple of years, I never really understood why. Then I opened up another channel, and I felt what was going on during the ritual, and I stopped questioning. I just wanted to be part of it again, and again, and again. Because something really deep happens. If the ritual is sacred and spiritual, your self disappears in it. Not rave, not ecstasy, nothing extreme. Just a very clear, no thinking act. That's ritual. When you don't think, just do it. Your whole life can be like that if you are clear. But if you have to have defense mechanism, if you have to guard yourself, if you have to have some agenda, then selflessness is not possible. Because you have to maintain something. You have to maintain your firewall. You have to have your hand on your own weapons. So ritual takes away all that, if it's correct ritual. Because some rituals, admit it, it has some trapdoors, something hidden, some mental frequency that is not really explicit and not clear for the participants. That's ritual done in bad faith. I've seen it. It's not good. Extremely careful. We have to be super careful with rituals so that people would understand the basic principles. It's not an analytic process. Like I said, you cannot understand the process with rational thinking. But people, especially those who are in control of rituals, should be super faithful and extremely truthful what they are doing and why. And the how is a little bit less important. It works. Most rituals have an explicable part and an inexplicable part and we should be kind of quiet and clear about what we can and cannot explain 
but if we don't feel the function, if we don't feel that it works, if you don't feel you can become one with it and kind of, in a healthy sense, lose yourself in it, then don't be there. Everything is up to your presence in that. If you maintain your thinking, it's a mistake. If you hold on to your I, my, me, it's a mistake. But if you lose your awareness and you lose your clarity, that's also a mistake. Okay? So rituals are super important because that's what can, they, they can help us become one. They can help us regain our original state of mind. Okay? Most important, believe in the ritual. If people don't believe in the ritual, they stay outside of it mentally, although they are in it physically. Big mistake. Okay? More questions? So there's a, there's a part of me in listening um, that knows all, that has heard this. It feels very comforting to hear all this. And at the same time, um, it seems like a lot of words, not that you have a lot of words, I mean, people who teach, um, it, it, it's a, it's, it comes across as a concept, and yet I know it has nothing to do with the concept. It's like pointing to the moon, and the, the idea is get to that moon, and these are steps on the way. So what, I, what came up for me just right now after Kathy talked um, was this idea for me of essence. So to me, it seems like what we are wanting, perhaps yearning to get back to is our original essence, the face we had before we were born, um, and which I think I see as, a, as a, another psychotherapist in the room myself, I see that when people are able to get back to that place, they connect with, I call it essence, perhaps you, you use another word, they get back to a place which they always had and which they lost. So it seems like what you're saying, in my mind, is these are ways to get back to a place that we always had that we never lost, but we thought we lost it because we went somewhere else. But it's there. It's available. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. <laughs> you can call this essence, substance, Enlightenment, Buddha, doesn't matter. And that place is here. And that time is now. It's not in the past, not in the future, not in a projected present. It's, ju it's just this moment. And that's the key point. There are very, very few dogmas. It, not even this one. But Zen is extremely direct. And it points directly to human mind. And that has a time and space relation. You can attain that only in this moment. And when they asked Sum Sansolin, what is this moment, I love that answer. Of course, he could have given any kind of Zen snap, you know, momentary perception, but he said, one per infinite time. So that's actually the best kind of intellectual rendering, this T per infinite. This infinity is this moment. We have nothing else. And when we come to terms with that, when we surrender to this moment, that's when we can become one and we can attain something which we can never think of. The word for this, as you said, it's, we give a lot of words. But why? Why don't we just stay silent or do some mantras and that's it? Because you're hungry. Your intellect is hungry. You could have put some delicious dine or supper into your body, but your mind is hungry and it wants to know. Now we come to the paradox, how can we know something that cannot be expressed with words? Well, we first circumambulated with some ritual thinking, and we get closer and closer and closer, like good hunters, and then, when the mind is prepared, you demonstrate. And then knowledge is superseded and transcended. And that's why these words are important. We have this thinking sickness, this attachment to concepts. And of course, the cure comes from the same realm. Otherwise, it would be pretty hard to swallow. It's like bitter medicine, but the clever mother puts it into some syrup for the kid. Uh, tastes sweet, but 
it isn't. So that's why in the old Taoist you know, writings they said, good teaching is bitter, correct path seems to lead backwards. Now, you don't experience that much bitter teaching because it's very hard to sell. You know, <laughs> Nobody really wants to taste bitter. So what do teachers do? They make jokes, they are humorous, they tell stories, they are being personal, they explain, they use symbols, they talk about various things you might be interested in, just that you would swallow this one bitter pill of don't know. That's why. Merci. <laughs> More questions? So, I can't seem to figure out how to let go of choosing to suffer. Can you help a little with that? Can you repeat your sentence? <laughs> yeah. Um, Feel free to rephrase. I do not necessarily... I make choices that aren't always good for feeling good in my body. And I seem to like to do that, but then I suffer. And then I feel bad. What's your question? So far this is 100% human. Nothing unfamiliar or wrong about it, neither is right. but. What's your question about this? We love to do this. What's your question? I really love to do it. Um, how do I stop something that I want to stop, but I don't want to stop at the same time? You don't. You wake up from it. In other words, you don't fight it. If you fight it, it becomes worse because you put more energy into it. You see this cycle. And you first ask, what is this? What am I doing? You still cannot stop your hand. But at least you have a perception what you are doing right here, right now. And then it belongs to the challenge to admit to yourself that in fact I'm making myself suffer when I'm making myself feel so good. Okay? And spend some time acknowledging this. Don't run away. Don't try to fix it because there's still too much energy in this cycle. Perception actually pulls it back, but it's a very invisible process. Perception actually stills the mind. That's why it's called, in all traditions, in two steps. Shamata vipassana, that means stop and perceive. In Korean, kan hua son, is the same thing. Still the mind and perceive. Now, reverse this. If you try to perceive, at least part of your consciousness remains unmoving. Because that's the mirror that perceives. It's still very teeny little surface, very fragile. But you already do that. So spend some time acknowledging that you are doing this to yourself. It's a precious phase that we skip because suddenly we want to get out of it. We take some pills. We go to some people who can give us some good advice. And then what happens is that when we feel absolutely satisfied, we go out there and get dirty again and worse. Because now we are stronger. So this kind of play between suffering and happiness, feeling good and going to hell, this can go on forever before we take responsibility. And how do you do that? First you have to see what you're doing. So first of all, sit down within. Don't run. Sit down and say... What is this that I'm doing? And don't try to stop yourself. Extremely hard. Because the moment you see you judge, remove the judgment, remain with the perception, and tolerate yourself making that mistake for some time. Until your resolve becomes 100% that you will not do this again. And when that threshold is reached, you become stronger than your karma. And then you can stop for a while. Then it recurs. We are extremely stubborn with our attachments, especially if they work. So then, when it reappears, then you perceive again, you realize what you're doing again, and you stop again. Why? Because it will take shorter time. 
you have the experience of stopping. You have some strength, some kind of resolve. We say in Zen, your center became stronger. Uh, when I went to rehabs and uh, taught you know, ex-addicts, they were physically clean already. They spent at least six months recovery, group ther therapy, you name it. Then we came in with the professional partner. I was teaching meditation. She was teaching uh, various social and uh, life kind of ca counseling, whatever. But none of them stayed. None, actually, one of them stayed as a student for about 10 years. None of them did. None of them wanted to do this. Because they realized they can become clean. They can become more or less non-criminalized members of society. But they will never give up addictive behavior to the extent that meditation would take them. And they didn't want to go on that path. So, usually 10% of uh, a given normal social group stays with meditation. That's a very healthy ratio. With ex-addicts, it's 1,000th. It's really rare. Because if you get used to addictive behavior, and it's extremely hard to stop because you satisfied yourself so much with it, and you learn to live with it, that you don't want to get out of it. It's too well known, it's too familiar, it's too gratifying, plus you became old in it. Because you do 10, 15 years of hard drugs, it, takes away 40, 50 years of your life. So, when you actually can stop the mind moving, <coughs> you gain so much energy that only gravitons could talk about it. But black holes do not emit light. Gravitons do not talk. Your true self doesn't have a, a, a kind of Excel chart of red and black. In other words, you don't know how strong you are before you get tested. Okay. So when you see a kind of self-perpetuating suffering, don't go with it. Don't run around like a little dog in, a, in an arena chasing the artificial rabbit. Stop and look. After perception, you see cause and effect. And when your decision reached critical mass, the 100% resolve, then you act. Not before. Okay. Other questions? Um, I'm not sure I understand everything, you know, but uh, it's really uh, it's shaking me quite a lot. And I was thinking of uh, what you said about uh, what you could, can call evil or uh, le mal in French. Le mal. Well, le mal. And... Uh, hearing about Auschwitz and uh, what I know about the fact that uh, it, things have not changed in the world uh, since I don't know how many, many centuries uh, when you see that uh, you still have people cutting their neighbors with a uh, you know, ash, uh, a chet, a chet. So, what do you think that what you say could... You know, I'm very impressed, you know. And uh, how c can it make something evolve in the human uh, nature? Because uh, I feel we, we kill quicker, uh, more industrially. Uh, but I don't think... I don't see any really progress in the... It's a spiritual uh, position. Actually, it's a very, very valid and wonderful question. And now come with me to a journey to space. In that space, there's a spacecraft. And the captain of that spacecraft has a vow. Space is very cold. And the captain wants to heat up space. This infinite darkness and cold. And the ship is very powerful. It has several... Uh, ion drives and nuclear plants and whatever. It's a huge ship. But somebody informs the captain that if he disperses all the heat from the spaceship, it will stop, it will not get to its destination, and people aboard will die. And the captain has to make a very tough decision. Try to heat up space and maybe inspire other spaceships to do the same. 
or reach the destination with the available fuel that they have. So you have a choice. Either you keep uh, applying external solutions to the world, which many people tried, fantastic minds. They tried in, uh, chari from charity to military, they tried to fix this world in so many ways and so many times that the jury is still out whether they work or not, but most of them do not seem to work. Or you say that I live my life as a human being, seemingly average, Keep, but I direct most of my mental energy insights that I could evolve and actually have an internal quest attaining something more noble, higher, and more enlightened than this karma that we have to see here and suffer from it. So either you fix yourself or you fix the world. But the world never changed in known history. And only for those did it change, who actually changed themselves. So if you change yourself, the world changes, because it's ultimately your experience and your mind that determines what kind of world we are living in. And this is not a passive thing. Your experience is also what you do to the world, not just what you get from the world. Okay. So that's what the Buddha... In fact, the Buddha's change or 180 degree turn from becoming a ruler of his kingdom instead of being the great hero who conquered himself. That's the change I'm talking about. And uh, I think this country where we are, France, had periods of history that are so exemplary in the futility of any violent group effort to stage a revolution, kill the ruling class, <laughs> Then the revolutionaries killed themselves, and there was a dictator who conquered basically Europe and established itself almost twice before he could be banned to uh, St. Helens. So, and all this happened from 1789 to 1812, and the Russians were saying hello in Paris at the end. So, that shows that karma goes around and around and around in cycles. And if you don't go beyond that, you are basically trapped in events that are way beyond your control. The biggest futility comes from those who are actually believing that they are in control because they are powerful politicians, financiers, military, etc., etc. They think they are in control. They have the hubris of being attached to their own power. And they don't translate that into responsibility and selfless help to others. It would be possible. It is possible to create a more enlightened society, but not through external means, through internal means. And that's why uh, teachers of the way, they all suggest that you work on yourself. That changes the world. But if you just work on the world, you remain largely unchanged. That's why. Yeah, but uh, other, uh, other religions, uh, religions, yeah. For instance, uh, Christian Christian religions works on uh, love. For instance, loving the other will bring a different world. And I mean, the Christian religion does that, and I think uh, many others, and uh, doesn't seem to work. And people are supposed to work on becoming uh, more loving, uh, more pure, more uh, less selfish, and. Uh, if we don't take away our judgments and dualistic emotions and all kinds of attachments to good and bad, how could we genuinely love anybody, including ourselves? We can't. We are trapped in our own ideas. So loving each other, love your neighbor as your brother, is a great idea, except we haven't removed the hindrances from it. That's why substance is so important. We talked about substance, truth, and function. You don't attain substance, there is no truth, and we are so far from ideal in function that is just a different world. I want to do this, but I'm doing that. And the two are completely at odds. Why? Because we have our karma, our attachments, our distortions. If you have a mirror and you write something on the mirror with a the lipstick, then that's exactly where the mirror will not reflect. And you can write love 
into the mirror. But that's where the mirror will be ineffective. Okay? <laughs> More questions? You spoke about substance, truth, and function. And I do not figure out how the, all the three work together. Could you tell more? Sure. Thank you. Uh, I use the metaphor, and I will use the metaphor first before any Buddhist explanation. You know light. Light which is kind of fading out at this part of the day, because the sun is setting. So light. A stream of photons that enable us to actually see so many things physically. Uh, then you click pictures with a camera, still images of your journey, of an excursion, of a family reunion. And then you shoot motion pictures also with cameras. And then you watch it as a film. So substance is the light, truth is the still images, and the motion picture is the function. Next level. When you practice, you can attain this state of not knowing or not moving mind, when nothing comes or nothing goes, yet there is this mind without object. The old text says, a mind of no mind. Okay? I will elucidate that by quoting a dialogue between Bodhidharma, a thousand years after Buddha, and Emperor Wu. Bodhidharma was the person who carried the Dharma from India to China. And it the whole journey before he actually stood before Emperor Wu took two to three years. He learned Chinese, he prepared himself for the Chi, he actually stopped several times on the way. So, Emperor Wu asks him about Buddhism. He wanted to test Bodhidharma, what kind of teacher he was. And in the Lotus Sutra, there's a lot of talk about merit. You help uh, monks and nuns, you build temples, you gain merit. And you help the Dharma, you also gain merit. It's actually pretty obvious. If you put your energy to benevolent things and uh, you know things that actually help people get enlightenment, eventually that cause and effect relationship brings you know indirect benefits to you. You know? It's very different from the Western idea that was prevailing in the Middle Ages. So that was some kind of ideology. This is actually a very clear relationship, very clear karma, etc. So there was truth in it, people experienced it, but the emperor started to test Bodhidharma and said, I built countless temples, I supported countless monks, how much merit did I get? So then Bodhidharma says, no merit. The emperor's eyes opened this wide. Then he launches his second weapon and says, but then what is the meaning of the Holy Scriptures? Then Bodhidharma says, no holiness, only infinite empty space. The emperor wasn't untrained. The last and final try, he goes, then who is standing in front of me? And then Bodhidharma says in Chinese, Wu Shen, that means don't know, or no idea, or no thought. You can translate it in many ways. Wu is nothing or no, it's mu in Japanese. And shin is shin, that means no mind, or no thought. And when the emperor heard that, then he says, we have nothing in common. Dismissed. So then Bodhidharma went to Shaolin, and he sat for over nine years, uh, facing the wall. And then many people came to venerate his cave, recognize his special powers, etc., etc. Then after nine years, Hui Ko, the, the first patriarch, came. And that, that's another story. But then Bodhidharma started to teach. So what Bodhidharma alluded to with these three responses, and what Zen teachers often express with this, that's all substance. No name, no form, no thinking. No coming, no going, no life, no death. If you read the Heart Sutra, it's no, 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 no. Because we cannot tell you what it is, but we can easily tell you what it is not. So it's no eyes, no ears, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. 
No past, no present, no future, no realm of eye, eyes, no realm of mind consciousness. But as a substance, if you want to define it, you fail. If you cast off the illusions, that is just like light, unfiltered, it just floods you. Okay? Substance. Then comes truth, the still image. Without photons, there is no still image. In classic photography, you, have a, you had a 35 millimeter thing, and there was a chemical reaction which helped photons burn an image on, that was film. Now, there, now we have sensors and digital photography. Whatnot. But it's the same process, essentially. So photons, the substance, burns the truth onto the sensor. Sky is blue, trees are green, floor is gray. This stick is remarkably rainbow. So, that's the truth. And then you see, if you don't apply it just to objects, what you apply to human beings, you see somebody is disoriented, somebody is sad, somebody... What kind of emotions and thoughts do people have? If your perception is fine enough, you can perceive that. The next question is so what you do with that perception. What you do with the image. What kind of movie you make out of the still images. That's the biggest question, and that's when your function is determined. You determine that no one else. What you do with that truth. You see your spouse coming home totally exhausted and tired, and it's your choice to actually push him deeper or actually elevate him from that. Other questions? Uh, being a psychotherapist myself. My goodness, how many of you are? <laughs> <laughs> There is I'm something that. <laughs> I'll also tell you why. Okay, I'm looking forward to that. Um, there is something that I, I value very much, which you is very much? value. Right. You, you value very much, okay? Which is humility. Okay. And that manifests itself in my way of working that I cannot know what is right for another human being. Now, I know that there are other types of psychotherapy, which I'm sure there are present here in this room, where I think the therapist has the knowledge and know how to get to that knowledge, helps the patient to get there. And I would like to ask you, what do you think about humility? Uh, humility is the quintessential part of actually helping another person genuinely. If I presume to know better, I am just as arrogant as anybody, you know, on some seemingly high stand. Uh, if we realize we cannot know better than someone else about their own psyche or their own fate, we stop making these huge declarations and explanations. We actually help them ask the right questions that they would explore by themselves who they are, why they were born, why they are living their lives. So if we ask questions regularly and clearly, uh, we realize how much we don't know. And that huge experience of don't know takes away this really fraction of an idea that we actually used to know something. But you can't blame people for knowing because, it's, in fact, we are striving for it so much we want to know. But the more we know, the more we should realize how much we don't. And in terms of human relationships, I think anybody in a pedagogical or therapeutic or teaching position, we have to go through our own hell of trying to help with our knowledge and failing. And then we realize, actually, we don't have to know. We have to see. We don't have to judge. We have to feel. And then you help your patient ask the question, give some direction, and actually building trust and confidence that they can actually do that. They can follow the way. But for that, your internal strength, your internal clarity are essential besides humility. When we actually stop uh, this categorization, who is above and who is you know, inferior, then uh, we can have some genuine connection. But the reason why we have to have our strength and our wisdom lined up with this genuine compassion which I associate with humility at this point, with your permission. Because immediately the client or the patient can use that humility in his or her attempt to overpower you and dominate.
the therapeutic process. It's a very clear defiance and self-preserving mechanism trying to avoid something they don't even know, but they already feel that they will change. They have to. Because this genuine presence, if the therapist can present that, will, without any force, compel them to change. So that's where your strength and your clarity have to team up with your humility. Because that's how you can reflect the projections back without being reactive. It's very different from being dualistically reactive. Just when you reflect back and you refuse to identify with the projected image that the client inevitably, due to the unpro unprocessed you know, karma, they just spit on you. So when you can patiently and compassionately just let that flow off you, then your face is never changed. Your image cannot be dirtied. And then strength actually teams up with humility. And then wisdom directs the next step. That wisdom is also non-dualistic. We say in music, you have to improvise, you know, to be a good musician. Uh, what actually prevented me to go to the faculty of psychology was this huge amount of conceptual framework and knowledge that were required to actually sit down with a human being. Now I think different. I think those guidelines are necessary. I worked on, you know, transcendental type of meditation for so long that I see that being uh, somewhere in infinite time, infinite space without boundaries is equally dangerous. It's one of the dangers you can live with. But the other danger is being stuck between conceptual boundaries and trying to be in the safe zone of established scientific methods. If you don't go beyond them, you cannot explore, you cannot improvise, and you also cannot genuinely help. But if we are with our own kind of infinite time, infinite space, great you know, moment, then we can actually lose this humility. It's possible because you believe in yourself so much. So how do we find the middle way? And that's why I said earlier to the question, we need to have the best of East and West combined, seeing how we can make it complete, how we can attain that complete. So humility has a wonderful and great role together with the additional uh, qualities that uh, I dared to quote. Okay. Anything else? You didn't answer the, the, your own question. You said what you was that? be a very bad client. <laughs> <laughs> was that a question? Well, I thought you, you were supposed to answer to that. Would you like to talk about it? <laughs> uh, if I would like to say if you would be a bad client, mm -hmm. I could not say that now. So I will help you out. I'm an extremely <laughs> stubborn person. And uh, I don't want anybody to analyze my suffering. Because it became my fuel. It became something that tremendously motivates me. And I use my experiences in the past, all my mistakes, uh, as a fuel. And polarities between right and wrong, between what we did and what we wanted to, are extremely powerful. But when they seem to destroy us, we need help. When they sustain us and nourish us, we can already use them. I didn't trust therapists and psychologists ever in my life. I'm sorry. This is not personal, it's business. And the reason is because I never, ever wanted to lose my spiritual independence and give up even for a second. And, and see what happened. I became a monk, I became part of a tradition which is largely built on humility, obedience, etc., etc. And I really accept the word of my spiritual superiors as binding. But when I approached it from a Western point of view, I didn't feel I should follow anybody. And, of course, you can write it to the account of having two medical doctors as parents. <laughs> that, that, that came with the job. Okay. And uh, now I actually learned that, uh, like I said earlier to the question, that these two things, the two kinds of approaches, can be combined, and therefore I can trust that. In fact, 
as we talked with Maggie earlier before this uh, Dharma talk began, I had a hugely positive experience with Western applied uh, uh, a kind of group therapy, and I'm sorry if I rough a few feathers, but that was family constellation. So the, the Hellinger type of school, it has many branches and offshoots, mm -hmm. and I was asked to teach meditation in one of them, and of course I started to learn from them immediately. So teaching meditation there meant for me that I actually tried to become one with their minds, with the morphogenetic field prevailing in that room. And I had the, the fortune and the privilege to be part of really dozens and dozens of constellations experiencing the beautiful principles of Zen moment to moment in it. I didn't go there for that. But it came as a verification that, yes, you don't depend on the scriptures. We didn't use any of that during the constellations. Yet, yes, there is mind-to-mind -mind connection, unspoken and clear. There is a transmission of roles and there a transmission of subconscious content which becomes conscious through you. And it's healing. It's amazing. So, we actually had to get to that. When you're a university student and you read Freud, you say, oops. And I, this, I know somebody, maybe even more people are using old Freudian cognitive analytic psychology, and it's great, because it's not the same as 30, 40 years ago. We all know that. But when you're an untrained, unripe, arrogant university student, then you have your own opinion on everything and everyone at first sight. There you have it. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Um, it's about being a Zen teacher. I have a question uh, for you. <coughs> Why did you decide to be a Zen teacher? Did you decide? And what does that mean for you to function as a Zen teacher? Fortunately, Catherine, I did not make that decision. Uh, my master, Zen master Sung San, appointed me as a teacher with a kind of ceremonial recognition in 1999 August. And I had a huge internal conflict whether to take it or not. I didn't consider myself ready, not even ripe for it. But I trusted the vision of my master that I could actually grow into that. And it's uh, taking a little longer than I wanted, but maybe it's working to a certain extent, at least to answer some questions to the extent that it motivates people to practice. And allow me, it's not really the decision how you allow yourself to become a, a Zen teacher, but how you remain one. That is a tougher one, at least for me. What it is that kind of gets you out into situations like this and uh, allows you to reveal whatever you allow yourself to reveal. Whatever you presume to know instead of just being silent. And again, without uh, quoting or blaming Zen Master Sung San too much, I trust him. I trust him deeply to the last core, last cell, last little fragment of his teaching and his work. Uh, 24 years ago when I started the Dharma, it was him, his person, his lineage, his tradition that actually saved me from very bad states of mind. So if he says nearly 10 years later, then this is your job, then I humbly accept and I try to, to do that to the best of my abilities. Nearly exactly the 10th year of my teaching activity brought that question or group of questions extremely clearly to the fore, in a way that couldn't be escaped, or mitigated, or modified, or just procrastinated. And when something doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. So that's how we can remain who we believe we should be, as a personality, as a job, as something we do. But Probably musicians, we have at least one musician here, can tell you what magic that moment of silence has when you finish a concert. That moment when the four parts or five parts or three parts of that musical composition is over. And there is no hand clap yet, but the music has already ceased. That 
moment of silence has depth that no one can describe. You have to be there. So the depth of uh, the mind's merging, the depth of one meditation, the shine in somebody's eyes just for one moment makes it worth for lifetimes. Because there's no other way you can achieve that unless you really undertake it 100% and you commit yourself to it and you stick through it thick and thin, day in, day out, rainy or sunny day, it doesn't matter. And you work for years and years and years and then you have one of these moments. And it's all worth it. It's fantastic. So, as far as I'm concerned, I'll be happy to see you in years, many years, in this. And I hope that will happen. Next question. Could you say something about changing karma? You mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. What kind of karma would you like to change? change. <laughs> I didn't know there were many kinds. Are you wearing only one kind of clothing? No. Likewise. You, you ask your lady friend, where can I buy clothes? And then she'll probably ask, sweetheart, what do you want to buy? A shawl, a skirt, a blouse? You didn't know there are many kinds of karma? I honestly don't believe you. <laughs> but I had to take a little round before I disbelieve you. You know about karma way more than you reveal. So, are you ready to ask the real question, or should we dance around a little more? How can you change? I love you for this. So, maybe you will not love me after this, but what kind of karma would you like to change? The karma that you f that feels like it's the way it should be. This is like the ghost saying that you cannot govern a country with 537 type of cheese in it. <laughs> You're so general, like a general. You're guarding your position, that's okay. But you might want to be more specific. I don't want to pry into your affairs or life or whatever, but if you ask a question, you get an answer. You don't ask, you don't get anything. Too much thinking. Spit it out. Can you say what karma is? <laughs> Can you say what it is not? No. <sighs> Let me help you with this. Okay. Not forgetting that you haven't asked your real question yet. <laughs> karma, mm -hmm. what's your name? Seal. 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 Karma is cause and effect, action and result, whether in thought, word, deed, emotion, whatever. Furthermore, it is the accumulation of cause and effect, the accumulation of these results, the formation of these into habits, the habits into personality traits, these traits into personalities, the persons into groups, the groups into societies, the societies into civilization, the civil into species. The very smallest and the very largest in our lives follow the same rules. Mm -hmm. Enough? Mm -hmm. Now you can ask what you wanted. That, that was it. That, that does it? That does it, yeah. I doubt that, but I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> that does it, thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Yeah. Lee? Um, because I'm not sure I understand the, or I know what is the word karma. For me, it was... Uh, I give the explanation I, I have, which even if it seems stupid, uh, for me it's the idea that you you have something in your uh, you lead a life which is already written uh, as a scenario, for instance, and it is already written because of because of the the way you react to whatever happens in your in your life but you have no other way to, to react that's destiny yeah. that's actually being For me, oblivious it was something like destiny. very good 
So I'm glad you brought this up because many times we apply karma as some kind of destiny or fate or whatnot. Look, your free will is made of the same atoms as your incapabilities. If you can look at it this way, then the karma that you were born with and you accumulated for many, 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 many lifetimes, and the actions that you decide to do out of your free will, they follow the same rules. These rules. So, your accumulated karma that you have no power over, because you haven't seen it, you haven't processed this, you attach to it, you identify with it, that's your destiny. It's in your chart. I'm sure you have seen it. So if you look at any astrological reading, that is a blueprint, not a complete printout. It's a blueprint of all your accumulated karma that you brought with yourself into this incarnation. And to the extent that you don't see it inside, to that extent, that controls you. So people say, it's my destiny. I had to be a soldier. Okay. Did you have any control over yourself? when you made that decision to follow the call or obey the orders to become a soldier? Probably not. So to the extent that you see your karma, to the extent that you detach from your karma, to the extent that you see your karma originally does not exist, to that extent you can become free. And to the extent you attach to it, to that extent you follow the statistical probability coded in your karma. And that karma is nowhere else, it's in your eighth consciousness. We call it alaya, or alaya vijnana, your storehouse consciousness. That is your huge hard drive. In fact, a farm of hard drives with all your lives in it, mostly subconscious. Luckily, if it was not subconscious, we would go nuts. Imagine you would be living parallel lives as a princess somewhere down in Spain, or somewhere in Germany later, or somewhere in Scotland, or somewhere in South America, or Africa, wherever, and then you have your current personality as the dancer over chaos. No. It's very clear that it's subconscious. It has to be. That's why birth is such a huge line between the past and the present. That's why normally we don't remember past lives, and you don't have to. Please, don't think it's a necessity. It can be a byproduct, but you can easily discard that. So to the extent you can see your karma, you see how it operates. You see how it operates in this moment. To the extent of your clarity and strength and compassion, you can turn your karma to a different direction from the statistical probability that is coded in there by your previous actions and speech and emotions and thoughts. Alright? There is no destiny, originally. Just like originally there is no karma. But we made it, we forgot it, we follow it. Archetypes. Jung is great with that. It's all the shadows of your previous karmas and previous lives. Every single lifetime has big morals, huge imprints, huge events, and all those events are stored in your consciousness. And all the unprocessed stuff comes out either daylight or in dreams at night. And mostly daylight, you know, during the day, we repress it with our rational thinking and sensory perceptions. That's why we can't see them. Then it comes in your dreams, especially recurring dreams. They are huge indications of homeworks inside that you haven't finished. So there are various ways to describe the content. You can go with archetypes or some skaras that are um, consciousness drivers from inside. Okay, Drivers or vectors inside your mind that kind of hone your will or point them to different directions. Okay, These are reflected in your seventh consciousness, which is your judgmental mind, your duality maker, when you make decisions over right or wrong, I want, I don't want, this is me, this is not me. That's all based on previous experience. So that's like the controller. And from the eighth, the storehouse, the seventh, the duality maker or judgment maker, 
There's the sixth, which is your conceptual mind, your CPU. That's how you form your concepts. That's how you, that's how you link those concepts. Your CPU actually processes all this information, translates that into your physical being. The five physical senses, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body, that is touch. So if you look at the psychophys psychophysical existence of a human being, we are describable with these eight levels of consciousness. However, your true nature is not one of them. If this is something which sees all this, perceives all this. And if you perceive all this, you can make a decision. If not, your karma, your habits control you. Okay? So thank you for your question. Wonderful topic. Um, I guess I'm wondering or struggling or whatever the word is about the I, my, me part and the seeing and the enlightenment part and uh, I I'm not sure how to word it, but in a sense, uh, I, I get a sense of the seeing. At the same time, in the living our lives, uh, I also see sort of the inevitability of the I, my, me in, in the everydayness of being. Like, because uh, I guess I link I, my, me, as you say, is with identification, with the thoughts and the believing yeah. and the hanging on to that. Yeah. And... Um, you made a link with dropping that in a sense. Mm -hmm. Those are my words to reach the seeing in, mm -hmm. as I understand it. Yeah. But at the same time, listening to you, I also hear a lot of I, my, me. In, in your, in How would you not? Exactly. I open my mouth. Exactly. <laughs> so that, that's where I guess I hear the nonsense of my question, but at the same time... You should hear the nonsense of my teaching. That's it. Well, that's that's uh, that's that's where I react in a sense. That's, that's Are you also a therapist? Yeah, like pretty much everyone. <laughs> Everybody's a therapist. I'm the only client. <laughs> well, um, I guess it's 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 okay. The, the, What's your name? The seeing Nicholas. Nicholas. The seeing is like very still and silent, and. I guess I'm worrying about action and not uh, the identification, dropping the identification, yet being in action, as opposed to just... So what does your girlfriend say about this? That I think Worried much. about action. Sorry? Worried about action. Did she notice that ever? That I'm worried about action? Mm -hmm. I notice it. Did she notice it? I guess I haven't known her long enough. <laughs> if the relationship is so fresh, yeah. do, herself, do her a favor and stop worrying. Worrying makes the eye stronger. And at the same time, it acts like acid, on, like a corrosive material in metal. And it makes you weak. Worrying is not really being curious or even considerate. Worrying is having this uncertain, mostly repressed fear. So, turn it around, ask yourself, what am I worried about? Or, what is this that I'm worried about? Or, what is this? And this, what is this, is not about your substance. This is not what I taught earlier as the who do, the main question of yourself. This, what is this that I'm worried about, is directed to a specific karma inside. You can use that, just like you said, the focus of this machine to one meter, two meters, four meters, or into infinity. What is this as a question of substance opens it up to infinity, but when it has a specific object of mind, your worry, it works the same way. The photons are the same, whether they travel in empty space or they hit this stick and show it as a rainbow color. It's the same thing. Your mind operates exactly the same whether it has no object, one object, or several objects. Clear? Okay. So, if it's not, then, then look at your own ears. Your ears do not change whether there is silence, one sound, or several sounds. I, I think this, this should be at home. Okay? So you look at yourself and you ask, what is this thing that I'm worried about? And you separate your primary object of mind what you are worried about from your reaction 
to it that you're not certain does she love me or not? Are we going to be together for a long time or not? Should I do this or not? Should I buy her this big flower, this small flower, a small lap to a fell, or actually take her there? <laughs> the point is that you should really see in this moment clearly the primary level of your perception, whether it's inside or outside, and separate it from your reaction. Feed your reaction back to your mind. In other words, let go of it. The energy comes back. The form of emotion, worry, concern, anxiety, everything, it's gone. Take off the wrapper. Just feed the energy back directly where it came from. It seems so powerless when we meditate and then something appears, you let it disappear. It's extremely powerful. Because you don't attach to that particular form of appearance in your mind, namely worry, this, guy, this time or in this case. You let go of it, you don't define it, you don't judge it, you don't check it, you don't hold it, you don't want anything with it. In other words, you just take all your energy out of the worry. It comes back to you. Worry disappears. People do the opposite. They try to separate themselves from worry, <coughs> run from your fear, you run, you make fear stronger, finally it kills you. But it was, it was yours. You created that fear. But you stopped to look. You didn't turn around, you didn't face your fear. You started to run, so it killed you. You became the victim. Except that you could have turned around and stopped your own fear or worry or anxiety just by looking at it. And taking all the energy out and you don't make it. And that taking the energy away comes by being still and not doing anything. It comes back to you. But if you keep it separate, you try to push it away, you judge it, you make something on top of it, it's not going to work. It's contrary to normal or everyday human thinking, but go deeper and see how your own crisis evolved. This small thing, something you or someone you didn't like, went into one reaction, two reactions, three reactions, chain reaction, domino effect, you were done. You weakened yourself, you lost the moment, you lost your drive, you lost your simplicity, lost your wisdom, etc., etc., and you just cut yourself up into small dysfunctional pieces. And we do that mentally all the time. That's why we say, and become one, become clear, make it simple. These are not empty words just because we want to follow some patriarch's footsteps. These actually work. So if you don't want to worry, Face your worry and say, what am I worried about? And then you see that your reaction and your action are not the same. Clear of the reaction, stay with your primary intent. That's why intuition is so important. Intuition comes from this one mind, this clear, no time, no space, clear mirror mind. So, in that sense, you stay in the moment, you stay with your primary perception, you, you don't second-guess your decisions, and if you believe in that and you're courageous enough, soon you can stop worrying, because it will become all right. But first you have to try, and you have to allow yourself to make mistakes, and correct those mistakes, and the only thing that can drive you through is your own honesty, and your own truthfulness, and your own pure intention, and then everything can be forgiven because mistakes are honest mistakes. It is possible to live that way except we don't want to try because we don't want to make mistakes, we don't want to look stupid, we don't want to apologize, we don't want to be humble, except we want to always know better, we want to prevent, we want to predict things, etc., etc., and it becomes this materialistic, predefined, predestined, terribly passive jail. And that's what materialistic society suffers from. We lost our drive. We lost our spontaneity. We lost our primariness or originalness in this moment. And when you regain that because you have kind of shaved off all the secondary, tertiary, all kinds of reactions, then you become original. Then you become yourself. Your girlfriend will love it. <laughs> so are you saying that the fear disappears? Or is it just that as I witness the fear, it still continues to arise and it also just disappears on the horizon? In other words, is there, is there something that 
sets us totally. I mean, not. I don't know how to say this. You don't have to, because I can answer you without elucidating to the very end. Hmm. So, you have a dog, and the dog bites and barks and even bites the owner and barks at everybody. But if you train that dog, then the dog goes back to his little house, and only if there is a thief or somebody dangerous, then the dog senses it, comes out and barks and protects the family. Mm. Fear is the same. Fear is neither good nor bad, but if you are afraid of fear, if you're attached to fear, if you want to disengage from fear or identify with fear, it becomes your hindrance because the dog bites you and you are struggling with it. Train the dog. Train your feelings. Train your perception. And that training is clarity in this moment, nothing else. It doesn't depend on any technique, any method. It depends on you. We don't drink the cup. We drink the water. Remember that when you are doubtful about technique. You don't drink the bottle. You drink the liquid. But without the bottle, without the cup, it would be extremely difficult. So we use them. So again, techniques are neither good nor bad, but it's not the primary objective. It's a means to an end. Fear is also one of your valid emotions as a human being. What's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong except when it overpowers you. So fear can also become addictive because it produces a hormonal reaction and we love our adrenaline shock. Why do you think you know, people go to very dangerous places and sports and watch certain kind of movies, etc.? Because it spins them at 7,000 RPM. It makes them sweat. It makes them breathe and pant and red. And now I'm alive. Why? Because I'm afraid. <laughs> and partially it's true. It's deep down there. There's nothing stronger than fighting for survival if you're attached to life. So to the extent you're attached to life, you are afraid of death. That brings you this huge dynamic to survive. Okay? So fear is all right. There's nothing wrong with fear. Just like there's nothing wrong with a dog that rests in his house and eats and sleeps and is a good dog, but when the time comes that there's a thief or some threat, then boom, goes there. It is very reasonable to be afraid when you have to be afraid that something really goes wrong. Then again, just like with worry, you separate fear from the object of fear, then you look at it very clearly. It's not rational. I'm sorry. It will be too easy. It's less than rational. It's non-conceptual. This non-conceptual wisdom sees thoughts and emotions equally. E emotions and emotions, as emotions, thoughts as thoughts. We don't mix. But they're equal in terms of your own karmic reactions. And then you deal with the moment, with your primariness, with your originalness in this moment then fear goes back where it should. And you don't even notice your dog. Your courtyard is huge. You have other animals to deal with. Nice birds, chicken, cows. Cows give milk. You have to milk them. And the dog doesn't have any job. You feed them twice a day, morning and evening. That's it. And dog is happy. So fear is your friend. If you train, no problem. More questions? I, I will be very rude. Please, <laughs> humor me. Uh, I don't believe in what you just said, or maybe I didn't get it well. <laughs> uh, because, of course, uh, it's a, the, to compare with the dog, uh, well, it's a, it's a nice uh, way of teaching, you know, and... Uh, take my hat to you. Uh, as you said, you are good at it. But when you fear something that's uh, really uh, vital for you or for somebody you love, you know, if it's a uh, life and death uh, danger or uh, di strong disease or, uh, you know, real stuff, uh, big stuff, how can you become, uh, you know, part yourself from that fear? Your meditation practice gives you that experience. In fact, when you do formal meditation, you actually clearly let go of or put down your emotional and cognitive reaction to reality as you see it. 
inside or outside. So actually, your question happily reinforces the main line of this teaching, just from another angle. It's like your question says, you cannot carry this piano into this small room. Of course, if it's horizontal. But if you turn it 90 degrees, two people or four can easily carry that piano, whether it's a concert piano or smaller, into that room, turn it 90 degrees, and then set it on its feet, and then you can play. So it's the same thing. You don't overreact, but we are humans, we react. So this reaction is okay, just don't confuse it with the action itself. And if you overreacted, that means you reacted to reaction and reacted to the second reaction. And we can do it in a nanosecond. We can, that's it, 10,000 minds. 10,000 minds. One moment. It's possible. But equally possible the way back. You can take away 10,000 karmas in one moment if you perceive that you are not any of that karma or those karmas. Okay? So... Yeah, fear can be, in fact, great martial artists and warriors and people who work with dangerous things and they are also in the kind of forehall of physical death. They talk about fear. Extreme sports people also do that. But their fear is different from the uncontrolled kind of sweating, paralyzing thing. It's very momentary. It appears and disappears. And they know how to handle it. In fact, they know how to draw energy from it instead of fear drawing their energy away. You use your karma, you win. Your karma uses you, you lose. It's that simple. It depends on your mental training which one happens. Okay? Your center is strong, your karma cannot control you. Your center is weak, your karma controls you. This center is this not moving, not coming, not going, clear mirror consciousness. That's it. You let that be broken or distorted, you are broken. Uh, earlier it seems to me that you opposed um, the way of meditation and the way of, you know, the way of, of changing oneself to the way of changing the world. Actually, please finish your question yeah, and I'll so answer. My question is why oppose them? I oppose them because most people see it in opposition, but I try to build a bridge just by prioritizing. In Latin they said, ate in cipi, which means begin with yourself. It doesn't mean you stay passive or on the mountain forever. It means that you begin with yourself. If you don't attain the correct view, how could we have correct livelihood, correct meditation, correct speech, correct energy or effort? How could we do that? So this correct view begins with yourself. And then you can help this world. But perhaps we can agree that by the time you develop this correct view, your view on the world also changes. And that's essential. If we don't change ourselves, the world also doesn't change. There's also something prior to that. We don't become clear about ourselves. Then we don't see the world either correctly because we are so much blinded by our own delusions. So perhaps that settles the dispute that didn't yes, exist. Yes, I just want to say that in my uh, in my experience, working with the world is also working on oneself. True. That's that's great. And so we don't we don't uh, have to wait to be fully enlightened. <laughs> Actually, would you say that? Because I never said that. No, no, no. I am just, I'm, just, I'm just making more... I'm just trying to be more, you just add more precise. just fire to because, the pizza? Because okay. sometimes, sometimes people can, you know, uh, twist around what they, what they hear. So anyway, I'm extremely I'm like, careful not to twist. Yeah. Okay. I actually twisted my knee four years ago. That was a very bad experience. <laughs> so, I was really careful, beginning with yourself, and then you can extend yeah, that to the world to the extent that uh, you actually can believe you have made some meaningful changes. But uh, perhaps we can agree that many, many people, out of sheer goodwill, they don't train themselves, and they immediately want to change the world, and as we say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's what I wanted to address, not passivity. I and mean, we are in Mahayana Buddhism, and these days, Theravada, 
they also don't stay in the hermitage for the rest of their lives. They come back and build huge hospitals, things like that. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. No, I said, I was just thinking it's not, it's not by chance that so many of us in the room are in the helping profession, psychotherapists. Um, and for me, this is part of working on myself, working with other people, but being clear uh, what's mine and what's theirs. So that was just a comment. And then uh, it's not really a question, but it's a request. Before we leave, could you, just for people who are not coming back, say a little bit about your temple, because we left things down uh, downstairs, but I don't know if everyone even knows very much about you, and then talk a little bit about tomorrow, so that those who are undecided will know that tomorrow will be, I think, I silent. I really right. promise that those who are undecided will remain undecided as far as I'm concerned, because you will have to make the decision yourself. So, uh, following Judith's request, we have a temple being built in Hungary for the last nine years, and uh, everybody is cordially welcome to get to know it, and if you believe Zen practice would be good to try, you're welcome to come. Just an hour of flight. And uh, we follow the Korean Zen tradition, but we welcome everybody, beginners or other, you know, members of other, other traditions as well. And we have uh, an absolutely simple daily schedule with three practice sessions per day, some work and some free time. Uh, of course, it's fully vegetarian. And uh, we have uh, by now six hectares of land, partially garden, partially uh, just grass, and we have several buildings. And uh, some people in the audience have had the experience and also uh, lots of effort you know, to make that temple happen and I want to thank them here also for doing that and it's, uh, it would be, it would be uh, just a pure delight if uh, like-minded people would come and we could practice together and we have one 90-day retreat per year one 10-day retreat per year and every month we have a weekend retreat and uh, these retreats consist of uh, chanting, sitting, and also kongan practice. This kongan practice is actually a test and training instrument of your own intuition. So when we talk about substance, truth, and function, everything gets tested and developed in the interview room. And this interview room is very interesting because you definitely change by the time you get out of there. Whether it's a five-second interview or a 50-second interview or... 15 minutes, it's not literally longer than 20, then, uh, then you have definitely changed some of your views. And the interviews have two parts. One is the Kongan teaching that you get because that's what you went there for. Another part is directed by your own questions that uh, you want to personally ask. And uh, the second part, the question by you, is optional. My questions are not, so be prepared. <laughs> so... <laughs> Basically, we go through several stages of Kongan teachings, and if you endure, and if you can deal with your own frustration, then uh, you can actually answer those Kongans, which you will learn are only byproducts of something much greater. And this much greater is the purpose. We call that don't know. And the answers, you know, will develop and be refined. It's a very exciting and fantastically, I would say, enlightening process. And... Uh, the, the temple itself had, uh, had stages of, uh, of construction. It's not yet finished, but it's already functional. One last and final call for any questions about tomorrow's practice or basically anything you wish to ask. If not, then I sincerely thank you for coming here tonight and sharing the Dharma with all of us. And I uh, certainly hope that we can practice together in one form or another make a sincere effort to attain awakening and save all beings from suffering. Thank you. Ça suffit. That's it. <laughs> <laughs>